two, one. Okay, so welcome in. So laminar flow, Poisier's law. So here is the equation, okay, that Poisier has come up with. And this is for the actual volume uh, flow rate, okay, so within a fluid. And this is uh, a fluid, okay, a viscous fluid that we would have. Now, what I want to be able to do in this video is I want to be able to break down this particular equation and just simply tell you what all of the terms are and then relate it back, okay, to where this actually applies. So number one, okay, so the fluids, okay, we make the assumption that they're incompressible, okay, so that's one. Um, number two is that we are assuming that this is through a particular tube. So this is some kind of a circular tube. So if you were thinking okay, of it, you know, so the cross-sectional area that we would have is more or less, okay, or very close to um, kind of a, a tubular tube. So you would have a cross-sectional area if you would slice it through, it would be almost like a, a circle that you would have. Okay, so that's the second thing that we would do. Now, if you think back of volume flow rate in general, I can put up a link okay, up above there, you will recall that the actual equation wasn't very difficult. Volume flow rate just means, okay, how much volume will flow okay, per a unit of time that we would have. And what we could do is we could certainly find it by simply knowing the cross-sectional area. So that would have been this cross-sectional area. And then multiplying it by the average speed okay, that it is passing by. So the volume is passing by. And when we do that multiplication, then we're going to get the volume flow rate. So you might ask, okay, so well, you know, why are we having this extra, okay, more complicated one? Well, so if you're talking about you know, fluids, okay, and those fluids, you start introducing viscosity throughout, um, it turns out that we can use this particular equation, okay, in order to approximate the volume flow rate, okay, very, you know, accurately, okay, within the bounds of the actual constants that we have. And we may not always have okay, this particular um, speed of whatever it is on average what that fluid is passing through. So when we don't have that average speed, you know, what can we possibly do? Okay, so within here. So if I go back into here, okay, and I start introducing this equation and start talking about all of these different terms, let's do that one by one. Now, one thing that you will notice is that I kind of drew the actual fluid. Notice that the the speed along, okay, because of viscosity, so as you get closer and closer to the walls, right, the fluid actually starts to slow down. And as you get more towards the center, that's kind of fluid goes the fastest. This is kind of laminar flow, okay, and this has to do with viscosity, okay, that you have. And the closer it is, Okay, to the walls, okay, the slower that it will go. And then the further it is away, which is kind of the center is the furthest point away from the walls, okay, the faster it will go. Now, if you want, you okay, can kind of refresh yourself with regards to viscosity, I can put up a link up above there, at least just for some intuition. Now, for this uh, video and for the concept of understanding this particular equation, okay, let's do it, okay? And first, let's talk about what do we mean by the change in pressure in here, you know, and what are all of these different terms that we have? Now, some of them you will be very familiar with, you know, others you may not. So let's first start off with the change in pressure. Well, so one thing that we do know is that the pressure is going to flow from High, the high pressure point to the lower pressure point. So if there's a change in pressure, right, there's going to be a flow. So if that happens, okay, so if this is, for example, the pressure, and this is the higher point that I am at, the actual fluid is going to flow into the pressure where it's at the lower point. So this is from high to low as we're going through, and so the arrows are gonna be pointing in that particular direction. So if you're going to say that this is the change in pressure, then really what we're saying is what is the change between the high point, okay, minus, okay, the low point pressures that we would have. That is the change, and that's exactly what we are referring to right there, all right? So that's the change in pressure that we have there. 
Now, the second component, so this one is much easier. So this pi is relating to the fact that we are actually talking about the cross-sectional area okay, related to circles. So that's why the pi comes in. The r right here is referring to the radius. So that's going to be the radius right there. So that's what we have. So that's the radius or approximate radius okay, of the tube itself. We have a term, which is this eight. Okay, so that's a constant. Okay, this particular L that we have, so that L actually means the length. So you're gonna take a particular length, so let's say from one point to another, so from the high point of pressure to the low point of pressure, okay, and it's going to cover a certain distance. This is the actual length that we are referring to. That's my L in the equation. And now the only one last item, which is a little bit trickier, which you maybe have not seen, Okay, is this eta, right? So this is actually a coefficient of viscosity of the fluid. So this is viscosity okay, of the fluid. So it relates back okay, to how you know, thick okay, or how sticky, okay, how much resistance to flow you have within that fluid. Water, for example, is not gonna have a very high coefficient, okay? Something like a honey syrup is gonna have a very high, okay? You're gonna slowly see in just a moment, okay, that it is about 2,000 okay, times as uh, viscous as actual water. So this eta is related back to this, this idea and concept that you have, okay, of how much resistance you have within a fluid for it to flow. Now, if you want to see, there's a pretty neat kind of derivation of this eta. I'm gonna put up in the description, okay, which uh, a reference which I use within these particular videos. So I'm gonna put that reference within there, okay, which comes out from the open stacks, okay, it's free. Okay, you can take a look at the book, okay. It's a physics textbook and I'll point out which chapter it is. So if you want a little bit more, okay, on the coefficient of viscosity. Now for us, what we really want to know is the higher that coefficient, obviously the more resistance there is to flow. The lower the coefficient, the less resistance there is to flow. So now just to give you some kind of context, and this comes actually from okay, one of the tables which is provided in that book. So here's some context with regards to these eta. So I've kind of written them down. So notice that on the left, I put kind of the temperatures because yes, it will depend on what temperature you have. You know, so please always check when you're looking these up in the table. But you'll see here that water, for example, so this coefficient of viscosity is not very large. It's one, okay, approximately. Now notice the units. It's millipascals, okay, times a second, which is a strange unit, okay, but it is a unit. And if you want to put it back into SI units, just remove the milli, right? So that would have been 0.001. Okay, 002, so we can always change it back to Pascal's seconds, but this is more convenient, okay, for us because the numbers then are not very small. Now, blood, for instance, notice that it is twice as big, at least at 37 degrees, okay, as water. So it's more viscous than water, as you can see there. Now, look at honey, okay, it's actually, this coefficient is sometimes more than 2,000, okay, millipascals, so really, Pascals, okay, times second. So if you compare it to water, this one is one, this one is over 2,000 times, okay, as kind of has 2,000 more strength in terms of the resistance to flow. And that should make sense to you because if you compare honey and if you compare water, obviously water, okay, flows very naturally, okay, throughout. Now here is oil. Now this, I'm actually referring to olive oil in here. Okay, so this isn't kind of oil or, or gasoline, you know, that we're thinking about right there. Okay, although gasoline and, and crude oil are two different things, but this is just for regular olive oil. And notice that it's actually, you know, quite much bigger um, than water itself. So that's kind of the coefficient of viscosity. So this is the property of the fluid itself. It's the same as property in terms of like a density, right? So all of these are gonna have different densities um, for the particular uh, fluids that we have, well, they also are gonna have different viscosity coefficients, okay, for each fluid. And you can even take viscosities for gases, so gases are also fluids, those ones are gonna have viscosities much lower, 
okay, than actual liquids. And if you, again, if you want more, you can certainly look it up in that reference, which I'll put up in the description. So now for us, this is what we wanted to be able to dissect so that when we run into a problem, we can say, okay, well, we kind of want to know what the pressures are, at least what the difference in pressure is. We want to know what the radius, okay, over here is. What's that radius of that tube? We want to know what fluid we're talking about so we can look up the coefficient of viscosity. And then we want to know also what is the length okay, of the tube itself, or at least okay, within the tube, the length that we want to be able to observe this volume flow rate through. Okay, so that is the actual um, equation here for you. Now, I'm going to give you one item which should kind of, um, you know, hopefully tickle your brain a little bit. If you're thinking about this particular um, example here, I'm going to try to copy it. I'm going to bring it back down here. Um, so if you take this and let's take a look at one little short example. I'm not going to do any major examples within this video. I just wanted to be able to explain the components of the actual um, equation itself, so the formula. But one thing I did want to mention is the following. So very often, okay, within our circulatory circulatory system so within our arteries capillaries and so on okay and then our heart we know that it constantly is pumping now our veins i mean they're not exactly you know tubular like okay in terms of perfectly round okay if we're going to be cross-sectioning that area but we do know that it they you know they do come close okay or at least we can approximate it so one thing i wanted to mention is now you know within your heart you know one of the major problems is um, if we have okay, our actual arteries and we have some kind of blockages within or plaque which kind of starts depositing down okay, or some kind of narrowing okay, of our arteries. Notice that means that this is going to be narrowing down this radius. Now, when that happens, okay, when it starts to narrow down that particular okay, radius, when that blockage, now we all kind of know that, oh, well, that's not really that good. Um, now, the reason for that, why it's not good is because now there's going to be possibly much more pressure, okay, that you will have or that you will need by the heart, okay, so you're going to have to increase the pressure if you still want to try to maintain the same number, okay, of volume flow rate that you have because, you know, you're not really going to change, okay, what the actual blood is itself, right? So the viscosity coefficient is going to more or less stay the same for blood, okay? The actual length, okay, that it passes through, again, it's not really going to change. And so if you reduce this, even by 10% or 20%, then all of a sudden, okay, what happens is, if you would do that and nothing else changed, then this volume flow rate would plummet, right? Because these are proportional to each other. So that means volume flow rate will plummet. Then that means your body wouldn't get the same amount of nutrients. It wouldn't get the same amount of oxygen that it needs, etc. So what would the actual heart start to do? It would say, mm -hmm, well, we still need to pump, okay, just as much. Well, then the only thing that it can control, okay, is the actual pressure, right, that it starts to exert. And if you have a, you know, if you increase the pressure, okay, so the heart pressure, so that's kind of the high heart pressure that you might have, well, that's going to start having a major problem because you're going to start to increase the pressure. And who knows if, you know, your blockages or your arteries at the kind of weaker points are not going to possibly burst, okay, or some damage is going to get caused, okay, especially over time. So this we have to be careful with. And, you know, if it was only a term that, for instance, this to the power of four was not there, then maybe it wouldn't be as dramatic. But any small percentage of change, it has a big change on the actual volume flow rate. So, you know, if you take a look at this, so let's say, you know, if the radius originally, okay, is the same. So this is, you know, your radius one, okay, is, you know, it's some particular um, length, okay, that you would have, you know, I'm going to call it R. Now, if you have a blockage and out of that blockage, now all of a sudden, you know, let's say it's dropped by 20%. So that means your new R, okay, so this R is going to be, well, 20% less. So it's going to be 80%, so 0 0.8 of the original that you had. 
And now notice, if you take this to the power of four, look what's going to happen. So I'm gonna just take out the calculator in here, okay? And I'm gonna say 0 0.8, and I'm gonna take it to the four. So this is going to be, so 0 0.409, okay, six times r to the four. So what happens is, if this was your original radius, right, that you've had, okay, that particular radius, if it's a 20% decrease, right? So if you have some kind of blockage, which 20% decreases, notice that it's almost a 60% drop. So this is now 0 0.41, right, of the original that you had. So that would have dropped the volume flow rate by 60%. And if you want to maintain it, you're going to have to try to increase the pressure. Now, clearly, you know, increasing the pressure by 60% would have done quite a bit of damage. So the reason why I point this out, okay, and this is a very nice application um, of this particular law, especially for those who maybe are studying in health sciences, you know, be aware that this term, which is to the power of four, any small changes would have a big impact okay, on your pressure if your heart still wants to maintain the same flow rate. All right. So that is it, okay, for this video. Um, I hope that you found, okay, it understandable to be able to go through the equation, understand each term, okay, and what those particular terms are related to, okay? So please don't forget, you know, always keep them in SI units to make your life a little bit easier. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you in future videos. Bye, everybody.